Scotland's news and sport with the borders with Angela Swaby. Good morning. Health Minister Neil Gray has been in the borders to hear what's said to be extremely positive feedback for the health board's hospital at home pilot. 500 or so patients have been treated since last April. It's now planned to more than double the current more 20 local beds and introduce the scheme in other areas. It reduces the £2,500 weekly cost of treating a hospital inpatient by around half. It is likely funding will become an issue. There's only enough money in place for it to continue until the end of next year. But Mr Gray's confident hospital at home will realise its potential in the borders and elsewhere. There is so much good work happening across our health service and I'm very pleased that this is one of them, that we're seeing hospital at home and a respiratory service being provided at home here in the borders that is uh, preventing people from going into hospital where we know for many people it's not the right place for them to be. But obviously the budgetary situation that we're all facing is incredibly challenging uh, and uh, that requires the continued prioritisation. Uh, I'm very keen that I can continue to do that. The cancellation rate for NHS Borders' as planned hospital operations is the joint highest of any Scottish mainland health board. The latest Public Health Scotland figures found just over 10% were called off in June, the same as Dumfries and Galloway, only topped by Shetland. Most were cancelled on clinical grounds, others because patients opted not to go ahead or didn't turn up, but there were also hospital capacity issues. And in one service, NHS Borders is asking that colonoscopy patients give at least 10 days notice if they're unable to make their appointment. Tests for colorectal cancers and other bowel diseases already have waiting lists. Recent no-shows and last-minute cancellations are adding to the delays. Preparation for a colonoscopy involves dietary changes and pre-procedure medication. The board needs to know at least 10 days before so they can give someone else the appointment. A Hoyk farmer is leading opposition to the latest proposals for a battery storage park just outside the town. Bruce McTaggart says there was unanimous support at a meeting of Hoyk Community Council to object to Green Switch Capital's proposals for more than 100 energy storage units on a greenfield site by his Whitehawk farm to the north of Bolton Lodge Park. In the grand scale of the world, we are only here for a short period of time, right? And I look upon myself as a farmer, as a custodian of the countryside while I'm here. And I like to think that when I go, which admittedly is probably getting nearer rather than, rather than, rather than the other way around now, because I'm of a certain age, I leave my countryside where I live in at least as good, if not a better place than what it was when I came in. And by doing this sort of thing, I feel I'm letting, I'm letting it down if I let this continue in this specific case. We have asked Greenswich Capital for comment. Two trials set for Jedburgh Sheriff Court this week have been put off until next year. Gallish Hills woman Lindsay Kerr, who pleaded not guilty to willful fire raising, will now be tried in January. Robert Young from Hoyk will appear in February to face two charges of drug dealing. The postponements are down to other cases taking priority. Now, the moment Una Cameron from Bonchester Bridge became a world record holder. Eunice smashed the previous world best for the number of sheep sheared by a woman with around an hour to spare at a packed barn in Cornwall. She got through 517 ewes yesterday afternoon, almost 60 more than the previous record. Turning to sport in last night's East of Scotland football, Vale of Leithen, having got their first points of the season with a win on Saturday, lost 7-0 away to West Calder United. White Royal Albert were also beaten in West Lothian. They went down 3-1 to Livingston United. And one of the board's most successful rugby players heads back to Japan this week to prepare for his first season as head coach. Former Jed Forest man Greg Laidlaw became hugely popular in Japan following the World Rugby World Cup hosted by the country. Now he is making the step up after four years in Japanese rugby and his Urusaya Dirox sides promotion to the top flight. It's always a funny time when you come out of playing, I'm not going to lie to you, and there's, there's days you think, you know, what am I doing? And, <laughs> and you know, the game's kind of all I've known now for, for a large part of my life, and there's some days you think, you know, maybe I shouldn't be, and then other days that, you know, you're really you're into it, and I think at this moment in time, I'm loving coaching, and I, lo- and I loved being on the field last year, and and really connecting with the players and, and trying to push them to, to become the best versions of themselves. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a big challenge next year, back in the top league. Yes, 
and all the best with that, Mr Lidl. And it's looking really positively summery out there. I'm not entirely sure it's going to last, though. Here's Judith Ralston with today's Borders Weather. A dry start with some early sunshine. A weather front will bring thicker clouds during this morning with rain following on for the afternoon, which will spread to all parts. Highs of around about 18 Celsius with light winds. This evening starts cloudy with some showery rain. It will turn drier and clearer as we head through the overnight period. Westerly winds will start to freshen. Overnight lows of around 12 degrees. And that's BBC Radio Scotland's weather for the borders. We'll be back with more from the borders at half past 12. David Knox should be with you then. And there will be more news from the borders at half past four and half past five too. On digital radio. FM. Your smart speaker. And on BBC Sounds. BBC Radio Scotland. This is Good Morning Scotland with Graham Stewart and Gary Robertson. Murdo Fraser has announced he will join the growing list of candidates bidding to replace Douglas Ross as the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. The Mid Scotland and Fife MSP made the announcement on social media saying the party and Scotland needs real change and that he's the man to deliver it. Well, Mr Fraser last stood for leadership in 2011, standing against Ruth Davidson, who ultimately won that time round. Murdo Fraser joins me now. Good morning to you. Good morning, Graham. I'm quite curious about this. I mean, given the near wipeout of the Tories at Westminster and the polls currently suggesting that you'd be pushed into third place at Holyrood, why would you want to lead the party now? Because there is a great opportunity here to put forward a moderate centre-right party in Scotland, standing up for Conservative values, which are shared by many people across Scotland, indeed probably many more people, than currently vote uh, for the Scottish Conservatives. And I think with the, the right party, the right party being renewed and changed from within, and with the right messaging, we can expand uh, on the base we currently have. Remembering we are, of course, the second largest party at Holyrood uh, Presently, I think we can expand on that if we get it right, but it will need significant change. It will need change within the party. It will need a, a change to end the, 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 the top-down management of the party that I think has bedeviled us for too long. We need to empower our members. We need to recruit more members. Uh, and then having done that, we then need to set out to Scotland how we're going to renew Scotland because the 2026 Holyrood election can't just be a, a switch of people are looking for a change. It can't just be a switch from one left of centre party in the SNP to an, another left of centre party in Labour just because they have a, a, a different view on the constitution. It has actually to offer people in Scotland a real alternative with a, mm. with a party that is pro-growth, pro-business, pro-enterprise and pro-individual responsibility. Isn't it quite odd that there are, I don't know how many, but there are a lot of centre-right voters in Scotland and as you say, uh, they aren't voting Tory, yet you look right throughout Europe and you see centre-right parties doing quite well. Why is that not the case in Scotland? Why historically are the Scottish Conservatives failing to get that vote? Well, if you look what's happened in Scotland over the last decade in particular, the, the whole Scottish political debate has been driven by the constitutional question. Uh, and that means that if you're, if you're pro-independence, even if you're somebody who has small c conservative values, if you're pro-independence, you've tended to vote for the SNP, who are a party, of course, that want to deliver independence and another referendum. And because that's been the dominant issue in Scottish politics for, for a decade and more, that has meant that the, the pro-union parties have been scrapping over around 50 to 6 percent of the vote. Now, what I think is really interesting looking ahead is that now independence looks like it's disappearing off the political agenda. Even even people pro-independence are now saying there's not going to be a referendum anytime soon. And that perhaps opens the way for a much more dynamic and interesting landscape where people who are pro-independence but realise it's not happening, think, well, that gives us the freedom to vote for a party that actually puts forward ideas, for example, pro-business, pro-growth, lower tax, uh, reform public services, the sort of thing that Conservatives can talk about, and they might be prepared to lend us their vote putting the constitutional question on the side. I wonder if part of the problem, and this goes perhaps back to the Thatcher years, that a lot of voters see the Scottish Conservatives as an English party or a party that's uh, very much connected to, to the English party. Now, when you, when you stood for the leadership back in 2011, you advocated splitting from the UK party. Why have you abandoned that idea? 
So I've been very clear. I'm, I'm not going to split the party or set up a, a new one. In the 13 years since uh, 2011, I, I, I've looked at this idea, and I think there are major practical issues as to why that doesn't work. Mm. But that doesn't stop us being a party with a distinctive Scottish voice. And we can, within the Conservative Party, be able to articulate uh, arguments speaking up for the Scottish interest. So, you know, let me, let me give you an it, example it's, it's of that. It's just odd that you say that it doesn't, it is not likely to work, because it was only a month ago you were talking about this Canadian model where the UK party would fight elections in Scotland but wouldn't fight elections in Holyrood. Suddenly you've changed your mind. Well, no, I've been reflecting on this over, over a long period. Uh, you know, there is, there is some interest in this. There are other candidates in the leadership race who've, who've talked about this issue. Uh, I think it's, it's worth looking at this in the longer term, and that's why I've been talking about this idea of a commission. But and ultimately, it'll be a matter for the party members to determine if any changes were required there. But but even even with our current arrangements, we can speak with an authentic Scottish voice and speak up for the Scottish interest. So I was, I was going to give you an example, Graham, of what I'm talking about because when the, the 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 former Chancellor Jeremy Hunt announced in the in the spring budget, he was going to extend the windfall tax on oil and gas. Uh, that was a very bad policy for Scotland. It would have been very damaging for the, the North Sea uh, oil and gas sector, uh, a sector incidentally being much more damaged now by the decisions taken by the new Labour government. That's exactly the sort of policy that Scottish Conservatives can and should be vocal in saying we don't believe this is in, in Scotland's interest. And if that, if that means that t in, at times we have to take issue with our colleagues in Westminster, we shouldn't be afraid to do that. Right, but you, you've, said, you, you've proposed this new commission as you say, to review the constitution and the structure of the party. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, commission could come back and conclude that, yes, indeed, separating from the UK Conservatives is the best way forward. But that would be a matter for the party members, you see. This is, this is the whole point of my, my leadership pitch. We've had far too much top-down direction of the party. Uh, our, our membership in Scotland now is down to, I believe, about 7,000. I mean, that really is very poor for the, the second largest party represented mm. in Hollywood. I, I wonder and, if your Westminster colleague, the, the Shadow Scottish Secretary, John Lamon, he, he's writing in the papers today saying that this idea of commission is nothing more than a Trojan horse to break up the party. He's got a point, hasn't he? I think John needs to take a chill pill. Um, I, I think it's a little bit disappointing uh, that we're seeing these blue-on-blue -blue attacks uh, on, on leadership candidates. I've been absolutely clear. Well, he's saying that I'm you're not, the one that's been I'm divisive. Not, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to be t doing that. I've been absolutely clear. I'm not going to split the party, and I'm not going to set up a new party. But, but I think the suggestion that it's up to the leader just is indicative of the approach there's been to party leadership, which is entirely wrong. That's why I want to change the party to empower the, the, the membership and give power back to the membership. And if we're going to expand our membership and activist base above the, the very poor figure of 7,000 members we currently have, we will only do that if we give people a reason to join the party and participate and get involved in helping us. And simply treating the membership as people who have to do what they're told and deliver more leaflets is not going to do that. We have to give the members a real say in the future direction of this party. Okay. How would you deal with reform? I know